Welcome everyone to defining your open API spec. We started this series on the 7th of January with modeling your API and you can see the recording from that presentation at apicraft.co. Today we're, we're going to follow modeling with defining your API using the open API specification. The final meetup in the, in the series is about documenting your API. As part of API Days Jakarta, we're putting on an API design masterclass with the author, Mike Amundsen. I'll have more detail about that in a moment. What we're going to cover is we're going to review the, the model that we discussed in the last session. We're going to take a, a, a view of the, the web sequence diagram that we created. We're going to define an open API specification and we're going to discuss what's in it. And then we're going to translate a web sequence diagram into the open API spec. A good reference for, for what we're, we're doing is uh, the book Design and Build Great Web APIs by Mike Amundsen. Uh, the earlier sections on modeling drew on, uh, on sections of, of Mike's book. And what we'll cover today uh, are also drawn from the discussion we had about uh, web sequence diagrams and um, uh, and, and actually defining the, the specification. So a little bit of backtracking. I don't think anybody who has um, joined this conference doesn't know what an API is, but I, I find I'm constantly explaining it to other people and uh, I found this explanation helpful. So imagine if you, uh, if you, you know, everybody's familiar with Google Maps and the Google Maps API, uh, sorry, the Google Maps app on your phone. Everybody uses it for, for navigating, but Google have actually published this uh, service as, as an API and they, uh, without knowing anything about mapping, you can consume that, that service. So if you send, uh, uh, if you wanted to have a map uh, on your website or in your application to show customers where your locations are or how to, even more complex ones, how to get from A to B, uh, you could send a message like this to Google and Google would send you back a, um, a picture, an image of a map. And it gets more complicated than that. They have more than one uh, API endpoint. This is a static map, but you can also get uh, root information. You can uh, choose options to expose uh, different uh, layers and uh, layers of uh, different levels of, of detail. And you can specify uh, the, the size of the image as well as the, um, the, the scale of, of the image. So this as a, as a building block enables you to uh, construct quite, uh, quite complex um, uh, products out of, out, of these, out of these components. Okay, so when you, when you create a service that's based, uh, that is exposed through, through an API, you have to think about who the users are, uh, the users of that uh, API in a similar way that if you create an application, then you have to think about who, um, who's going to use it. So just as if you're creating an application, you would construct a user story that goes something like, um, as a um, person, I want to do something in order to achieve something else. Well, you would construct an API story. It's, it's really helpful to construct an API story that puts you, allows you to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's going to use that. So a good example could be um, as a distribution partner, I'm trying to distribute the products from, from another company. Uh, I, I want to create a new customer record and I want to do that in order to accept orders from the, from the customer and be able to place, uh, place orders with the, with the supplier. So this is a, a very simple example of, a, of an API story uh, using the same principles as what you would do with a, with a user story. Also, um, 
In the last session, we discussed the, the basic pattern of a, of a request and response style of API. Of course, they're not the only kinds of, of APIs, but it's a good way of just understanding, I'm going to send a request, I'm going to get a response, I'm going to figure out what the next step in, in this is going to be. So we discussed um, in modeling an API and a customer onboarding example, and the things that you want to do in order to onboard a customer, uh, firstly, you want to verify their identity. Uh, are they who they say they are? Uh, do, you, do you know exactly uh, who they are? And the next step is you may want to do some sort of a record check. If it's an individual, then you can um, use their, their ID information or if they're, they're a company, you may also want to um, verify uh, their, their credit history or some other uh, activities that they are really, if it's a company, are they really registered? And you may not be able to do all of that yourself or you may not want to you may want to get another agency to do that and uh, but you'll, you'll create that that act um, perform that activity to uh, to verify that they are the person you want to do business with you want to create the customer account within your um, uh, system of record and create a, a login for them uh, or uh, or other information that enables them to place orders or, or self-serve. And then you want to send them some sort of a welcome message. So you want to provide them with the information that they can then interact with you. So these are the sort of steps that you would do when you're onboarding. And if you are a, a distributor of another company's product, so you're in a... Uh, you're an insurance agent or your or your travel agent and you want to uh, sell um, uh, insurance to your your customer that comes from another company or you want to resell another company's product then the first thing you want to do is, is create this um, uh, this record uh, by calling by preferably by calling an api that does it so we, uh, we can break this down into a, uh, we can create a model of what this API would look like. And you know, we start off with a, a customer, our client application is a client, um, the actual front end application would uh, a customer asks to, to register. Then we, we ask them for uh, information to identify them. They provide this, this information. Then the application, the client application would pass this on to, to the back end server. So uh, we would want to do an on, submit an onboarding request to the server. If uh, we're going to conduct a background check from another agency, then we'll want to um, access their service, perhaps also through an API, uh, providing information uh, on the customer's identity that we've received from uh, from them and passing that on and getting a response back from the, the agency to say yes this uh, this person fits within uh, the d doesn't have any of the red flags that would suggest you wouldn't want to have them as a customer and then you want to go to your own accounting system uh, and to create uh, an account once the, the account has created, you'll probably get some sort of a reference number, an account number for, for them. And then you want to provide this, these account details back to your client application, which would then provide a welcome message to your customer. So this is the sort of activity that you're going to do in um, your, your customer onboarding. And if you're, um, if you're a producer of something and you want to allow your uh, distributors to be able to um, initiate this uh, this customer on onboarding in the system, then you want to expose an API that has uh, this sort of interaction either between your own client and your and your server or or between your distributors, your resellers, client application and your server. Now this is pretty much where we got to in um, 
at the end of the, the last session. So the thing that we want to do now is, of course, it, th this model, it's not, um, it's not finished code, but by going through these steps, we, uh, we identify the sorts of things that we, we need in order to uh, create this new customer account. And it's, this is a diagram that we can share with stakeholders, with, uh, with the developers who are going to access this, this API, with the distributed, with the business people who are going to uh, assemble the, the information or decide that they're going to use this and uh, other people who are going to track this. So there are a number of users of this sort of information. They don't need necessarily need to see the, the code. What they, they want to see to start with is an indication of um, what, what this is for. And that's, that's where a model is really useful. But to go from a model to code, we, uh, we want to take an, an intermediate step to, um, rather than just stepping down into writing code, is we need another level, level of detail about what are these things that actually get passed here. So um, we, we do want to translate this model into a specification. We're going to focus on the open API specification because it is pretty much is the, the standard for REST APIs, the uh, classic request response uh, a API uh, that is, uh, follows the, the style of, the, uh, of, of REST. There are other specifications for, for APIs depending on um, the, the, the specific implementation that will be, may be of most use. So async API is probably what you want to use if, if you're going to create a, an event-driven uh, API. And, uh, GraphQL has its own type of specification in RPC. But um, so they are, you may, you may still model your API in a similar way with a web sequence diagram, but uh, when it comes down to uh, the the implementation, you're going to choose one of these styles. So the open API specification, formerly known as Swagger and very often still known as Swagger. So this is a, a structured way to describe your, your API. It appeared around about 2014, or at least the version 2.0 of the Swagger specification that, um, appeared around 2014. Um, there are still a lot of um, 2.0 versions uh, around uh, in, in use. The latest version is uh, 3.0 and Swagger, when it was open sourced, became known as the open API specification, but a lot of people still refer to it as, as Swagger. And you will see um, both the 2.0 version and the 3.0 version uh, APIs in, uh, in, in lots of different places. It, uh, it is a good way of describing uh, REST APIs. It lists the, uh, the available endpoints and operations on each endpoint that you can make. So this example, if you wanted a list of users, then you would do something like a get users. If you actually want to create a new user account, then you'd use a, a post method to do that. And um, there are, the open API specification allows you to specify the parameters, the input and output for each operation, uh, and as well as authentication methods. So, uh, and there are two formats that the open API specification supports. One is uh, YAML and the other is JSON. We're gonna look at uh, YAML uh, uh, today but uh, it's also possible to define it in terms of, uh, of a JSON uh, schema. So there are three uh, main sections to the open API specification. The first is the info section, um, which is designed for most, is mostly designed for people. Um, it has a title and a description. It also specifies uh, the version uh, of the specification that it's uh, following and the other identifying information like service. 
The second section, uh, and sometimes the paths appear before the components and sometimes um, components before the path, but the, in the path section, it shows the, the actual um, URLs, the response codes, inputs and outputs for each endpoint. And in the components, it has the, the request and response definitions and other reusable chunks um, of, of information. So uh, the thing is, we, we need to get from our model down to the information that can be put into the, the specification. So some of the things that we may um, we may identify from having done this modeling work. Um, actually, this, this slide is, is taken from Mike Armisen's book rather than the, the web sequence diagram that I, that I had earlier. Um, but when, when we look at this, what we want to find um, from our model, we want to, want to identify, well, what are the resources that we're going to use and what sort of operations, what actions are we going to perform on them? So if we, if we have things like uh, we're, uh, we're going to start and we want to see what, uh, what customers there already are, um, then, then we probably want to do some sort of a, a read here. We want to see uh, what customers have already been onboarded. So we're probably going to want to read a list of, of existing customers. We're also going to want to uh, read an individual uh, customer search for a particular customer. And if we need to create a new one, then we'll want to write one. Uh, if, we, um, if we're dealing with a particular company, then we will want to check to see if we already have uh, a company record in, in the system. Otherwise, we, we, we want to write one. It's possible with a customer, a customer may have several different accounts. So this is um, particularly uh, an organization like uh, a bank. Uh, a customer may have several different um, types of account they hold with the bank. So there, there can be an additional level there. And then, of course, there's the sorts of activity that have been performed by the customer we want to understand. And the status of, of the onboarding, is it, um, uh, has it been approved or has it been rejected? So when we take those, those resources and the activities, then we can start to um, translate that into what are the, the resources and the, and the particular methods that we're going to use. So we want to read a list of what that corresponds with a get method. We want to write something to uh, to a database and pretty much corresponds to a, to a post. So when we, uh, if we update our web sequence diagrams, we start to add a little bit more detail. So instead of having um, just an arrow saying we're going to do something, we, we want to query the status uh, and we want to get a response. We want to um, initiate the onboarding with some information uh, and we want to get the identifier for for this uh, for this particular activity, this onboarding activity. Then we we're going to have um, creating these, um, getting these these different resources from uh, from the the source systems, or getting the status, creating new ones, and these are the sorts of additional information that we're going to add to our, our web sequence diagram. Um, so what, we, what I'm going to use flip to now is how we show that in uh, the Swagger Hub. You can find uh, Swagger Hub uh, in, a, in a free version. Um, so I'm just showing you a screenshot at the moment um, just so that I can uh, illustrate the sorts of things that we're, we're going to find in our open API specification. This is actually in the editor here, it lists them. So when you go to Swagger Hub, and there are a couple of other tools that will also enable you to do this. Uh, Stoplight is, is, is one that will enable you to create this definition. Uh, you can create API definitions in Postman also, um, although currently it doesn't export to uh, an open API specification, but you can still construct your, your API uh, in, in this, this tool. 
So what you see here on the screen is on the first line, you've got um, that this is conforming to the OpenAPI 3.0.3 version. And, uh, and then, so this whole, um, this top part here from row one down to, um, uh, down, to down to about 14 is the info section, or even the tags actually is the information section. And some of it is human readable. So we've got our, um, our description and, uh, and our um, uh, title of our, of our API. We've got some information about us so that people can contact us and also the, the license that people are, uh, are using um, in order to, to share this. Um, at this point, I'm going to flip from here to actual, actually, I think what's on the next slide? No, I haven't done that. So I'm going to flip from here to uh, the Swagger prompt itself. So I, this looks remarkably like the, the, um, the screenshot I had. But uh, the, uh, so in this editor, actually I'll go back to uh, my hub, I've got a couple of APIs that I've specified in here. And uh, I'm actually going to, I, I will take a quick look at this one, but I think it may be useful to walk through the sorts of things that you happen when you, when you create a new one. Now this part art, part science, because there isn't an exact translation from your web sequence diagram into the open API specification. Um, so you, you have the flexibility, but you also have the responsibility to choose what sort of details you're, you're going to, going to have uh, in here. So in here, we've got the information section, which indicates, well, it provides a description, which is really for humans to read, but it also has a URL. And I've created um, a mock within uh, Swagger Hub so that uh, I can test the API with, before I have the, the backend code to it. Uh, but um, so this is where people can find it in the information. This is really only human readable um, to describe what, what it is. Now we come down to, we, we're going to use these tags because these tags will be used to determine who can use the, um, the, the API. Um, but the, the paths where uh, we're, we're going to set in here. So if I want to have a, a customer path um, within, within this API, then there are, there are a couple of actions that I want to, to post on this. So I probably want to use a get method so that people can get a list of, um, of APIs and uh, sorry, can get a list of customers. And this may be an individual customer or all customers. So I can input a, a query string to, um, uh, to search for a particular uh, customer. Further down, I've got, uh, and, and the response to that, these are HTTP um, response codes, uh, status codes. So the typical um, response you'd expect to find here is a, a 200 which is uh, oh, everything's okay. Um, you've got a search re result. Um, but uh, the, uh, and then you're specifying what, uh, what information is gonna be returned as. And this is a, a JSON uh, array, array of JSON objects. So if, you, if you're looking for multiple customers and you haven't specified the search parameter, then you're going to get, um, you, you're going to get several JSON objects, each one of which represents a, a customer record, a, a type of array. Now this reference here, this is a relative reference to our, um, one of our components in the component section where we actually define the structure of a, of a customer record. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, a 400 response is where it didn't find um, the, well, a 404 is typically uh, 
didn't find the, the resource that you're looking for. So you put in a search term for a customer and it doesn't currently exist. Uh, or 400 is, is if you didn't put in a correct parameter. So that's the get method that you would use. And this is how we, how we define it. To define the post method, well, notice here, this, um, we, we set the, the tag being, this is only for admins. So we should be able to, to use this to add, to add one, uh, a customer record. We've got a little description here uh, and what the operation is going to do. The responses, it's going to return a 201 if, the, if a new customer has been created, a 400 if the, um, if the input is, is incorrect, uh, and a 409. Now you can decide these, but good practice is to have at least a, a 200 for a status okay. Uh, 201, some people use 200 to, to indicate success for a, a customer record. Um, rec a, a record to be created and this now the actual http status codes are, are specified by the internet engineering task force and you can look up a list of those well, while the rest style of, of api is based on uh, http it's very rare that there, there are a lot of http status codes and people who define apis uh, pick which ones they consider to be the most appropriate to use. And then in the request body, we expect to find something um, in this format. It's going to be a JSON object that gets passed to the, to the um, API in the, in the post method. And we're going to define it as this, um, uh, we've got a, definition of what the customer record is a little bit further down in, in the cut components section. So you see, this is the paths section uh, of the, uh, the open API specification. We had the info at the top and then at the bottom of this uh, specification, we, we have the components. So uh, it consists of a set of schemas. We, you saw a reference to a customer record uh, further up. So in a customer record, we're defining here that a customer record is an object. It has certain required elements. So we, we need uh, an ID, uh, a, a name, address, and an onboarding date. Now, of course, you, you decide which, uh, what um, parameters are required uh, in, this, uh, in this object. But uh, it, it would be based on also on what's what's held in, in your um, database, in a data store. Then the properties of each one of these um, of, of the components of the customer record uh, you define also here. So the properties for an ID, it's a string, and this is a, a UUID. So it's going to be something that's really meant to be machine readable, not. Uh, not human readable because typically when you create a new record in a database, say um, the database is going to uh, allocate a record number, uh, a unique identifier to this. The properties of the name uh, expected to be a string and this is an example. So you, by providing examples as you go, then you, you give the people who are reading this uh, API specification the opportunity to understand, okay, this is what I'm, what I'm going to find in, in here. The onboarding date uh, is going to be in a date time format. And you see here in address, it actually references another component. Uh, so instead of specifying address for this, um, for this particular customer record, um, we're, we're specifying, specifying address as a, um, a, a component that uh, can be reused for, for other things because you might have an address of a supplier uh, on to conforming to the same schema. So in an address here, you may have uh, some that are required and some that are optional. So in this case, we've got the address, uh, address one is required, city, postcode and country, but we, we have properties of this schema also including an, a second address line. So, 
uh, again, we specify not just the type of this, um, this component, but also um, the, uh, and, and we would provide an example. Uh, here we provide, we need to provide an example of even things that are not required uh, because they can appear here. So this is a simplified indication of what you'd expect to find in the open API specification. And I think it's worth just stepping through how you go and create one. Notice on, on Swagger Hub, you have other things that enable you to, uh, to work with this. You can see that in the, uh, for admins, uh, you have the, um, the post um, endpoint, um, the post method on the customer uh, endpoint and developers get to, uh, get to get that and it lists the schemas that we, we have here. So this is a short form you can drill down to uh, this information, but it's going to take you straight there to this section. So you can imagine an open API specification. If you've got lots of different um, uh, properties and, and components and schemas, then this can get quite complicated. Even in this simple one, we, we've got over 125 lines. So to navigate around this, it can be helpful to have these, uh, this, this little pointer here. Similarly, we've got um, the opportunity to, to drill down. I, I'll show in a moment that you can create a mock as you, um, uh, as, as, you um, as you start to define this and uh, gets listed here, uh, hosted for you by, by Swagger Hub. Um, and then the different methods and the opportunity to, to try, them, try them out. Um, so it's sort of, it's part summary and it's um, part the, the opportunity to, to actually try it. So I think um, if this is one that I created before, I can, um, let me go across here. If I try it out, then I click here and it's going to, um, this is, this has taken the examples that I uh, provided. It's listed, notice it's listed the, uh, is passing this customer record, which consists of an ID, a name, onboard date, and an address is itself an object, uh, a JSON object that includes all these uh, different, different parts to it. So uh, you can try out your, your call um, on, uh, on, on this tool, you can also um, export um, uh, some uh, sample code in different languages that, uh, that people can use uh, to, to try out uh, calling your API. So we'll go back to um, where we started actually. Um, so that, we, let me turn on a light. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm here and I decide that I want to create a new one, then uh, this, is, this is how, let me move this across where I can see it. So this template helps you to, um, to start off with your, the creation of, of your API. And here we, we have options here, whether we're going to use the original 2.0 specification or the, three point, the current 3.0.0. Uh, I can use a template for, uh, for different things, particularly uh, this is useful if I'm going to uh, add uh, authorization to this with, with an access code, but I'm going to create a simple, um, a simple API here. I'm going to give it a, a name. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, customer onboarding two, just so that I can show you how um, how I built this one. And I'm going to uh, eventually I'm going to make it public, but I'm also I I also want Swagger Hub to create a mock of the API for me so that I can I can test it. So I've got this option on. You can switch it on or off. 
So when I create the API, then it's going to take me to the, um, the editor and it's already created um, this, this part here. So um, you can see open API 3.0.0 and um, created it. Because I selected, I want to auto mock, then um, Swagger Hub has added this information automatically. It's hosted on its own virtual server um, under my ID. And then the description, I can, I can change this description quite easily. Um, and I'm just going to call it uh, this uh, here. I'm going to give this a, um, a title. And of course, the other contact information, I can enter this uh, myself. The key things here, uh, you know, I, I have these defaults. But of course, the, the example it's given me is about inventory, and I'm not doing inventory. So I'm going to change the path here to, uh, I'm going to look for, for a customer. And I'm going to, this summary part is, is really for the reader rather than for the machine. Um, so um, customer records, and I'm going to call it search, search customer. Um, and And then I uh, got references to inventory everywhere, but I'm going to change this. I can specify if I want to, uh, the sort of query parameters I can put in here, how many records to, uh, to return. And you see, I've got this, uh, the, the responses already, the, the basics uh, put here, and I can add more. Uh, 200 is, is okay, again, it's an app, uh, JSON object is going to be returned. The components, I'm going to change the what the schema is for, for this because, um, because it doesn't look like inventory. Uh, I'm going to specify the schema further down, but it's, I'm going to refer to it here because this is what we expect in, in here. And you see I've already got a cross, this is doing a, a syntax check here because, um, because Swagger Hub doesn't know about the customer record schema yet. I'm going to have to um, uh, define it further down. Um, 400 is if I have a bad input parameter. Um, here, I've got the post method that I'm going to use on um, for, for this. And here, I'm going to, going to change this to add a customer record. And I'm going to call it um, Add customer. Here I've got um, a 201 response for success, uh, 400 for an invalid input, um, and uh, 409 if the customer already exists. And the request body is going to conform to, yes, not this. Um, so, so this is so in the post, we're we're going to we're going to use the same schema for a um, for a, for when we're adding a customer as for when we're reading it. So we're, we're going to have to specify um, this. Uh, So of course it's possible to do this in any text editor, but the advantage of doing it in, in Swagger Hub is that it gives you these hints that things aren't um, uh, that aren't right, that uh, that it already creates this uh, uh, this structure for you uh, for for you to do. So in the component schema, well, the first thing I'm going to want to do here is to put in a, a customer record so that I don't um, violate this. Um, and you see that that cross has gone away straight away because now this reference here resolves to a schema that I'm actually defining here. But of course, I'm doing a few different things here. I'm not dealing, not interested in 
a um, uh, I, I'm not interested in the, the name here. I'm just going to remove this for the moment. Uh, and instead of a release date, uh, I'm going to call it an onboarding date. So you see the properties are very similar here. Um, this, this is a reasonably good match. So I'm not going to change these. I'm just going to change the names here as, as it, um, and I'm not going to have a, um, a manufacturer here because I don't, um, uh, actually what I want to put here is an address. So I'm, I'm going to create, so I have an address property in, uh, in the customer record and I'm going to create, I'm going to refer to it using a, a schema, uh, an address schema. So then I change the name and required, well, obviously not concerned about a name, but I'm going to put address one. Um, I think uh, in the example I created before, I, I said, well, I, I'm not going to require an address line two, but I am going to require that we have a uh, city and a uh, postcode and a, a country. So this, this doesn't actually specify the properties of each one of those, it just says that they are required. So now I need to come down here and I need to specify the properties of this. Um, oh, actually, the examples, I, I didn't change the examples. So in the ID, I, string is, that's a reasonable example, but a name of a customer, well, it's not a, it's not a widget. Um, I'm just going to give a, a name like this and the date time, of course. So in, when I come down to the properties in the address schema, uh, I'm going to have um, address one, and this is going to be a string, but the example is going to be something like um, a street number, um, um, what's a good street? Um, Main Street. And uh, we don't bother with a home page because we're going to have an address line two. And this is also going to be a string. It's not going to be a URL. Notice that uh, you can specify the format, but this is a simple string. And an example of it um, might be uh, apartment uh, 203. Uh, I can put a phone number here, um, but I think what, what I'm missing here is I, I need things like a, uh, a city. Uh, this is also a type of a string. And then an example, uh, I'm sitting here in Singapore. Um, and then I've got a postcode that I need to specify. This is also, well, I'm going to call it a string because even though postcodes in Singapore are numbers, uh, in other places like the UK, they are a combination, they are alphanumeric. So um, I'm just going to put something like this. And then what am I missing? I'm missing a country. And it's going to be something like this. So of course I can specify uh, other other um, fields that I'm going to have in, in this record. Um, but this is what I'm going to to have here. So you see, I've I've created this very very simple um, specification that has filled in the info section with this information. A lot of it I was given um, by by the tool. I've specified the, the different paths. I've only got one path here with a couple of methods uh, applied to it, and I'm uh, and the the uh, the request what's what's in the request and what's in the body. Uh, so what's in the response? So here I've got responses and I've got what's in the request body, and uh, and also the. The, the responses in this case to a to a post uh, is really only the status code, but a response to the get is I'm going to um, provide an array of these these JSON objects 
in response. And I've specified also the schemas that I'm going to use um, um, for the um, for what's in these uh, uh, these items of information I'm transferring. So when I define this, um, then I can I can save it. Um, and I can also publish this. So you see how I've, I've built up uh, this open API specification from here uh, and I can um, I, I can uh, then share that with people who are going to write uh, the code that calls it. I can also share it with the people who are going to build the code if I'm going to build the code also that um, that create um, that uh, implements uh, this, this API. So I'll go back to um, the deck now. Um, what, uh, what I've covered here is, um, actually I'll check, I'm gonna check in the chat. There. Are there any questions uh, at this point about what I've covered? So there's the chat. Nothing in the chat. Okay. Okay. So, what what we covered in this in this section? I'll go back to that deck. My presentation now. So, we looked at the the model that we started with and expressed as the uh, the web sequence diagram. We looked at the um, extra information that we probably want to think about uh, what are the what are the resources and activities uh, that we we're, we're going to um, uh, do and what are what are we going to um, okay I've got a series of questions now so let's um, Let's address some some questions. So, firstly, yes, I can uh, I can share a link to uh, the presentation. Let me let me just um, pause for for actually gone too far. Let me just uh, step out of this so that I can actually give you the link. But I need to. I'm going to share this. It's not really a secret. Um, yeah, I'm just going to put this in, um, but, uh, you can perhaps see, um, see this. Okay, so that's the first question out of the way. Um, that, that was easy. So the second question is, um, sorry, let me just scroll here. So the second question, is there any possibility to define the restriction of data to be retrieved or able to add by a creator only or by a certain operation of a user? Okay, so this is where authorization comes in. Um, so we saw in the uh, definition, we had some tags that were, were really um, describing for uh, who's a developer and who's an administrator. Uh, so one, one group of people only able to read information, another able to, to write information. Um, the, uh, so, we, we haven't gone into the complexity of authorization, but you would actually, uh, in your, your authorization uh, method, you, you could hand out uh, different um, tokens or, um, or API keys to people who would only be able to access, um, to, to read information, others to, uh, to, to write information. But that's, that's where it, it comes, not, not in this, um, simplistic uh, definition here, but you can uh, do that in the, the authorization uh, section. Um, the efficacy of the testing done by um, 
the done with the mock for Swagger. Well, the, the efficacy of the testing of any mock, uh, not just the Swagger mock, but um, the um, is that you're specifying examples that uh, that you're going to respond to, and you know Stoplight and Postman are similar in that respect. You can create a mock with them, um, but you, you really need to be, create the um, the examples um, of uh, that you you're going to respond in in this uh, in, in this mock. Um, that's not the same as having. A, a real system underneath this API that's looking at and providing uh, different responses to uh, to different types of input and having being able to draw on much more data than what you have defined in, in just your your examples for the for the mock. Okay, so um, we had another question: Can you discard extra elements in the incoming request through Swagger? Um, the extra elements in the incoming request. Well, I, I guess what you've got is you, that's, I, I think in, in terms of the, the swagger definition, you, if you're, um, if elements within a request are valid, then you have to have something in this section um, that, um, I go back to to here then you have to have something in this section that defines what they are right if some of the the elements are valid so if you've got um say a customer record and the uh, you know what what i've shown here is that the uh you need to have a um, a name an onboarding date um and uh and you you can also have a, an address. Well, if you specify it as required, then it has to be there. Uh, if it if it can if it's an optional piece of uh, of information, then you you can specify it in the in the property section. But if it's um, but if you specify it in the property section and you don't actually want to use it, then the underlying code. Um, would was just choose to to ignore that. So it's not something I, I don't think it's something you can put in the in the open API specification saying, uh, if I see this, I'm going to ignore it. It's, um, it's up to your code to decide that you're going to uh, that you're going to ignore it. Um, yeah, so um, thanks for that, for that comment, Lauren, I think I think you're um, you, you can uh, you can't simply discard it discard it within the with the specification itself. Um, I think if if the consumer is sending an element which is not defined in Swagger, then you probably should ref, uh, return a uh, a four hundred one response uh, a four sorry a four hundred response. This is not a valid uh, input, um, and you know you. I think, um, yeah, Florian, that's, that's a great comment. Also, you start small and then um, you, you um, create, a, create your own template and the, the new APIs you create can, can inherit uh, from, uh, from something else. Uh, and by defining schemas, then you can also inherit um, properties of, of the different schemas. Okay. Um, Okay, so what, what we covered, we, we talked about uh, the model that we would start with, and in this case, a, a web sequence diagram, the sort of information that we want to raise in, in, in this, and then uh, identifying the different resources and activities, and then uh, defining the open API specification. Um, we, uh, we translated the, 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 so we, we talked about the general structure of the open API specification and then uh, how you translate from your web sequence diagram into the, um, into the open API specification and, and you can create a mock there uh, within Swagger Hub and other tools like uh, Postman and Stoplight also enable you to create a, a mock. Mocking is a great idea uh, for, um, because it's a, 
what you really should do is define the API first, uh, and then the consumers of the API have something that they can test against. Um, the builders of the of the backend uh, code have something they can can work towards, and of course they can uh, they can check whether the um, whether a call to the mock gives a, a same response as the call to, to their own backend code. So this is um, so this is what I wanted to cover um, today. And uh, as I said, this is a series of, um, of, of of meetups. What the next step is that you really want to be able to document your API to some extent. Swagger. Uh, the, swag, the open API specification is itself a document, but it's a document that uh, only developers will read. And the, uh, there, are other, uh, there are other users of your API, uh, business people, business analysts who, who want to understand what, it, what it's for, uh, other stakeholders. And so we're going to discuss uh, how to document your API in the, uh, the next session on the 18th of February. As I mentioned, uh, we also have um, an API design masterclass. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, everyone um, in three weeks time on the 18th.